Vandenberg was born and raised in Florida. She has published three story collections and two novels. Most recently, the novel The Third Hotel and the collection I Hold a Wolf by the Ears. Her honors include a McDowell Colony Fellowship, a Pushcart Prize, an O. Henry Award, and a 2021 Guggenheim Fellowship. Laura Vandenberg's work blends the realistic and surreal. In her fiction, the bizarre often grows from the mundane. A conversation while washing dishes can lead us into a world in which men tranquilize their wives using off-brand LaCroix, and the move is so seamless that it's only at story's end we realize how Vandenberg has blended these worlds. Of short stories, she has said, the way the short story works is like putting a grain of sand under a microscope looking at one thing very carefully, but by magnifying that one thing, you see all kinds of other things. Her fiction is marked both by the economy of Vandenberg's language and a capaciousness, an exploration of genre and form that leaves the reader with the sense that these story worlds are always expanding outwards from that magnified center, helping us to see more than we expected. I'm so excited to be welcoming Laura Vandenberg to, to Ohio State today. So without further delay, let's pass it over to her. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm super happy to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, Alan, thank you so much for the generous introduction. Um, thank you to OSU for hosting me. Um, so yeah, very happy to be here. I'm going to read a short story um, from my most recent collection. Um, and that story is called Slumberland. So I will get to it. Slumberland. I spent that summer driving around at night and taking photographs because I could not stand the sound of my neighbor wailing through the walls. This neighbor lived in the apartment above me. And when I passed her in the stairwells, she looked perfectly regular, but at around 10 o'clock at night, she would start carrying on and her uncorked sadness had a physical effect on me. My skin itched, my teeth ached. A clear liquid leaked from one of my ears. Once I even got a nosebleed. I wondered if our other neighbors could hear her and if anyone had knocked on her door or called building management to complain. I did not knock on her door or called building management to complain because I did not want to confront whatever was happening in my neighbor's apartment. I wanted only to get away. The apartment complex I was fleeing was north of Orlando, situated between the Daltona Lakes and the Seminole State Forest. My life there seemed provisional, even though I had no immediate plans to move, and so it felt natural to wander. As I drove around looking for things to photograph, I added up what little I knew about my neighbor. She had lived in the apartment complex for six months. I did not know her first name, but from the mailboxes, I knew her last, Novak, unless that name was left over from the people who had lived there before, which was possible. Until this wailing situation, I had not paid particularly close attention to the mailboxes. My neighbor had a shoulder tattoo that spelled out something inscrutable in dainty cursive lettering. I often passed her hauling swollen bags from Dollar Tree up and down the stairwell. I had no idea what she did for a living. We had never really spoken, just waves and nods. She used to have a cat, but a few months after she moved in, the cat vanished. I remembered seeing signs in the laundry room, a photo of a black and white cat, the offer of a meager reward. Things my neighbor did not know about me. I have taken photographs all my life. My first camera was a Kodak. I used to make my living as a wedding photographer, but after moving into the apartment complex, I migrated over to pet portraiture. There was a surprising amount of money to be made in photographing German shepherds in bow ties. Plus, no one ruins their life by getting a dog. When I ran out of facts about my neighbor, I cataloged the subjects I had photographed so far. A sinkhole, roadkill, the molten night air and all the near invisible things floating through it. The sidewalk still damp from afternoon rains, the long dark arcs of highways, fluorescent lit parking lots, malls. There was a specific and terrible sadness to the malls. Those places where people went to give in to their loneliness. 
Sometimes I photographed human beings, a man sleeping under the scant shelter of a bus stop, a waitress smoking a cigarette outside an IHOP, Sometimes I parked in an unfamiliar neighborhood and walked around with my camera, my armpits dripping under my shirt. That was how I got the mother and son haloed in the warm light of their kitchen. The mother was kneeling in front of her son, who looked to be about six or seven, and dabbing ointment on his head with her pinky finger. So precise, so tender. Their house didn't have front lights or a fence, and so to get this shot, I crept onto their lawn, moving in a squad like the creature of the night I was becoming, ashamed of how much I enjoyed it. If apprehended by the mother, I could have said, I had what you had once, or a version of it, and I long to visit that lost world. When my phone buzzed at odd hours, I knew it was my sister sending me WhatsApp messages from Kyrgyzstan, where she and her girlfriend, where she lived with her girlfriend because they were both in the Peace Corps. How are you, she would ask, and I would feel the weight of all her unspoken questions, the questions she probably discussed with her girlfriend late at night. Nearly ready for bed, I would message back while stopped at a red light. If my phone buzzed and it wasn't my sister, then it was WhatsApp sending me strange spam messages, people asking for prayers or money or both. That summer, I got the same message, pray that we get the duplex so frequently that every time I drove past a duplex, I started thinking of the sender, whoever they were. Parking and walking was also how I started photographing Slumberland, a motel at the end of a residential street in my old neighborhood near Lake Monroe, an area I had not been back to in some time. The lodgers, mostly women checked in for extended stays, tended to look either like they had just arrived on earth or like they had been stuck in this motel for all eternity. Back when I lived in the neighborhood, every week it seemed some distraught woman was standing on the pitched roof and threatening to jump. This would set off a predictable series of events. Someone would alert the manager, who would stand out on the sidewalk in front of the three-story craftsman with a wild yard and a drooping porch. He would light a cigarette and gaze up at the woman with utter boredom and say, go right on ahead, it won't kill you. After that, he would go back inside and the woman would stand very still, looking a little stunned, and then scramble up the roof and through the th third floor attic window, which is how they always got up there in the first place, all of them agile as cats. I used to think that this manager had missed his true calling as a hostage negotiator. Whenever I ended up at Slumberland, I checked to see if there was a woman on the roof. Then I photographed the old-fashioned neon signs, the name spelled out in cursive lettering like my neighbor's tattoo, and the black cat that hunted lizards in the ferns by the entrance. I crept around the building to see if anyone had left the blinds open on the ground floor, and if so, what was happening in those rooms? Once, I got a woman trimming her bangs with nail scissors. Sometimes I had the feeling that someone was creeping up behind me, even though it was usually me who was creeping up behind someone. Moments when I would feel the air thicken all around and the hairs on the back of my neck would rise up like antenna. Yet when I spun around to look, I would find only a half-lit sidewalk, an empty car, silence. Across the street from Slumberland stood a sprawling white Victorian on a double lot, sunk deep in the rot of foreclosure. One night, when I was prowling around with my camera, I caught movement over there, two slim shadows slipping through the larger shadow of the foreclosed Victorian. I darted across the still street and snuck around the back where I observed the cutting beam of a flashlight and two teenagers, a boy and a girl, pressing each other down into the grass. The light disappeared. One of them must have switched it off, but it was a clear night and in the moonlight I watched as they shed their clothes effortlessly like dogs shaking off water. Their faces came together and then their bodies and that was when I started taking photos. 
Later, when I click through the images in my parked car, the windows roll tight and fogged, the radio at blast, my heart hammering, the teenagers look like quicksilver spilled in the grass. Was it better to die with a pillow under your head or stretched out in the grass? That was the kind of question that could preoccupy me all night, the kind that caused my sister and her girlfriend to worry. Because he had not died with a pillow under his head, he had died stretched out in the grass. A dare, a climb, a fall, that border between magic and annihilation crossed. These photographs are my best work and no one will ever see them. On the night in question, the shadows around the foreclosed house were quiet and there were no women on the roof, but there was a commotion coming from the third floor. The window to the attic bedroom was open, the walls bleached by harsh light. I watched from the sidewalk partially shielded by an oak tree. Two women were having an argument about what I couldn't tell. And then a woman was scrambling out the window and onto the pitched roof. She stood, her bare feet spread for balance and waved an object over her head, something small and hard and bright yellow, a drop of sunshine in her hand. The woman on the roof wore a pink cotton nightgown that hit her knees. Her legs looked as sturdy as logs. Her hair twisted up in a bun sat like a nest on top of her head. Do you promise, she kept shouting on the roof, dangling the object over the ledge. Do you swear? The one inside must have promised, must have sworn because the woman on the roof straightened her shoulders and nodded and then began her careful trek back inside. She was passing the hard yellow thing through the window when she slipped. Her hands slapped at the edges of the sill. The object clattered down the slope and fell to the sidewalk, smashed to pieces. The woman was beached on her stomach, her pink nightgown hiked up to her ass. I'm sorry, she cried. I'm so sorry. I hoped the manager might come out and be moved to help. Maybe all this time he had a mattress stashed in his office just in case. Because while it was unlikely that the fall would kill this woman, Ingalls, I knew all too well, could be unpredictable and cruel. Don't let her fall. I whispered to the one inside, fingers hot and tight around my camera. Two long arms shot out of the window and grabbed the flailing woman by her wrists. The one inside pulled, the one outside squirmed and kicked. With my camera, I got her pointed feet just before she disappeared through the window, two pale fish arcing out of the sea. The object she had been ransoming was a ceramic bird. It lay on the sidewalk with its head cracked open, its wings yellow splinters. The two little black feet were still intact, pointing in opposite directions, east, west, left, right. Clearly, the bird had meant a lot to the woman inside for reasons I would never know. Now a chunk of her private world was out here on display for all to see and for no one to understand. I strapped my camera around my neck and walked on. Not everything was meant to be photographed. I had parked right by a streetlight and once my car was in sight, I noticed how it gleamed strangely, like it was under interrogation. I stopped in the middle of the empty street, raised my camera to my face. On the way back to my apartment, I hit all the green lights, though I found myself wishing for a red because I had an uneasy feeling that something was in the back seat, cloaked in the shadows behind me. At the complex, I parked and twisted around to check. Of course, there was nothing. It was three in the morning by the time I got home. In the stairwell, I could hear my neighbor wailing. I went to her door and knocked so hard my knuckles stung. The door swung open and there she stood, the wailing woman, her chest heaving, her face luminous and swollen in denim shorts and a giant black t-shirt. She looked at once relieved and appalled to see me. What is wrong? I said to her. What is so very wrong? She squinted at me like I was dense, her eyes bloodshot and leaking. What isn't wrong? I watched the news. I couldn't argue. 
How much do you plan to keep this up? All night you go on, I can't sleep. You should try sleeping during the day. I have a job, I said, do you not have a job? Not all jobs are done during the day. I couldn't understand what kind of job my neighbor could be doing in her apartment in the middle of the night with all that wailing. I was just about to take a break. She snapped the purple hair elastic on her wrist. Do you want to come in? I did want to go in, to my surprise. It had been a long time. It had been a long while since I had spent time in another person's home, so lonely that maybe I had started making up presences in the back seat. Her apartment was neat and spare, a small burnt orange sofa and a coffee table in the center of the living room, a standing lamp in a corner, a glass bowl filled with red apples sat on the fake marble kitchen island. On the coffee table, I noticed a headset plugged into a cell phone, a thin black mic extending from the base. The headset was surrounded by boxes of tissues and eye drops and cherry throat lozenges. I sat on the edge of the couch. My neighbor brought over two clay mugs of tea. As she passed one to me, I tried to read her tattoo. All that we see or seem is but a dream within a dream, she said when she caught me looking. Edgar Allan Poe, artist and degenerate. I bowed my head over the tea, felt steam on my face. I repeated the phrase to myself, thinking about how when he died, stretched out in the grass, I had thought my life was over, but that didn't turn out to be right at all. Rather, the life I'd had was consumed by a life I never could have imagined living. So that's my job, she gestured at the headset with her mug, the crying. She explained that ever since she was a child, she'd been able to cry on demand, and in recent months, she had parlayed this gift into an actual job. She took calls for a fetish hotline that catered to people who were sexually aroused by the sound of another person weeping. Dacrophilia, she said. That's the technical name. The wailing I had heard from my apartment sounded like something out of a Greek tragedy. I had a hard time believing it was all a performance in the service of a paycheck. Why on earth, I said. Most people get off on trying to comfort me. Take it easy now, one day at a time. They say things like that. Every now and then I talk to someone who likes the suffering, who wants me to beg for stuff. Like what? She blew on her tea like my life. Without my neighbors wailing, the building seemed unusually quiet, even for the hour. I wondered if some people had moved out over the summer. So what do you do when you can't sleep? My neighbor asked. I drive around and take pictures. Can I see? She pointed at my chest. I looked down and was startled to discover my camera. I had forgotten I was still wearing it around my neck. I put my mug down on the coffee table and unhooked the camera strap. My neighbor sat next to me on the couch. She smelled a fruity body lotion and the faintest trace of cigarettes, even though I had not noticed a pack or an ashtray or any other paraphernalia in the apartment. I clicked through the photos, showing her the nighttime malls and highways, the sinkhole, and the mother kneeling before her son. I lingered on the teenagers fucking behind the foreclosed Victorian. In one photo, the boy's naked back was a silver arch cutting up through the dark. Jesus, she said, these are creepy. After I clicked past the last photo of my car gleaming like a little spaceship under the streetlight, my neighbor pressed her fingers to my wrist. Wait, she said, what was that? That's just my car. I went back to the photo. No, she tapped her fingernail against the small screen right there in the window. The moment I hunched over the camera, he appeared in the passenger window, trapped like a specimen in the glass. His face had a greenish tint, the borders bright and jellied, a liquid gone temporarily solid. A reflection, I could hear my neighbor saying, is that it? I did not know how to answer her. My breath was a thunder between my ears. He was the same age as he was when I saw him last, that liminal meadow between boy and whatever was supposed to come next. 
I clicked back through the Slumberland photos and then returned to the car. And this time he looked a little different. His face distorted from being pressed too hard against the window as though pain by having to wait for me to come back. I decided the world was playing a terrible trick on me and the only solution would be to destroy my camera at once and maybe even my car too. Possibly I should never leave my apartment again and get a job that kept me indoors like my neighbor. First though, I would have to get up. Could I lie down for a minute? I asked my neighbor. Sure, she checked her watch. She stood and collected our mugs. My break is up in five minutes, just so you know. I stretched out on the soft beige carpet and held my camera against my stomach. This never happened, I said to her. I never came here and showed you these photos, but you did. She stood over me, holding the mugs. My neighbor disappeared into the kitchen. I heard the slap slap of her bare feet. I heard the faucet turned on. When she returned, shaking water from her hands, she collected her headset and cell phone. She kneeled beside me and placed the phone just above my heart. Give it a try, she said. People like it best when they know the pain is real. She pressed the plastic band onto my skull and secured the headphones over my ears, positioned the mic so that I could feel the smooth edge brushing against my lip. She picked up my camera and strapped it around her own neck. She told me to get ready. What the fuck, I said to my neighbor, is happening, but it was too late. There was already a voice on the line, breathing hard into the phone, saying, what are you waiting for? Do it. Come on. The voice sounded muffled and strange, like it was being altered by a machine. Hello, I said to the voice. I'm here. Oh, if only the stranger could have heard me right after he died with grass under his head. I had gone on and on like my neighbor. My tears would have been the stuff of this caller's wildest, wettest dreams. I tried to remember the feel of his hand in mine, always a bit sticky and warm in the way of little boys. You weren't supposed to stay stuck with me, I thought. You were supposed to be nothing or you were supposed to be free. Still no tears. I remained a foot soldier in the long, dry march of the after. I asked the caller, what do you think happens to us after we die? My neighbor sprawled out on her side, raised my camera to her face. For posterity, she said, and then the shutter clicked. One night, months in the future, I wouldn't hear a peep coming from my neighbor's apartment, and the next morning I would knock on her door and discover that another person, a graduate student, had moved in. That was how things went in those big apartment complexes. They were a kind of purgatory where we docked until all our souls were called elsewhere. I stopped taking photos around Slumberland after the body of a teenage girl was found inside the foreclosed Victorian. A nasty surprise for the rich couple who had bought the place. Because I never saw or shot her face, I could not know if it was the same girl I'd photographed fucking in the grass, but I turned my camera over to the police anyway, desperate to be of use. In my neighbor's apartment, the phone was a hot weight on my chest and the caller was still panting. He was supposed to be nothing or he was supposed to be free, I said to the caller. Okay, said my neighbor, that's enough of that. Her index finger hovered over the phone, preparing to put an end to her little experiment, my camera swinging from her neck. Why? The caller roared just before the line went dead. Their voice came at me like a knife, sharp with rage and want. Why do not hurt? Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura, for that reading. Um, hello, everyone. Um, if you don't know me, I'm Lee Martin uh, from the Creative Writing Program here at Ohio State. And it's my privilege uh, this afternoon to moderate the question and answer session with Laura. So I encourage you to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to post any questions you might have. Um, 
Laura, that was uh, that was just a wonderful reading, a very powerful story um, from this collection. Um, I hold a wolf by its ears. Um, I highly recommend this short story collection. Uh, I'm in total agreement with Peter Orner, um, who says, I was as stunned by the stories and I hold a wolf by the ears as I was beautifully unsettled by them. I love that term beautifully unsettled because I think that's exactly what happens for me when I read these particular stories. So Laura, I thought I would start out uh, with a question of my own. Um, I notice in your, in your stories that you make really good use of very imaginative premises, um, either to begin the story or to become a way of driving the narrative once the story is underway. And I was really fascinated with the fact that you make such good use of what I guess I would call uh, atypical jobs as in, the story you just, as in the story you just read for us. So I thought I might ask you to talk just a little bit, if you don't mind, about the process of, of conceiving a story. What's that, what's that like for you? How does it begin? What first calls you to the page? Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for that question, Lee, and thank you for the, um, the kind words also. Well, I think that, you know, I mean, I feel like work in general is just such a rich space to write into in fiction. Um, I, I mean, the, the landscape of work does all kinds of, uh, you know, sort of covert and overt um, character work, you know? I mean, there's, there's the things that a character knows about their job, what they do and when they do it and how they do it and is it, what they want to be doing or do they dream of doing something else or is this the last thing they ever thought that they would be doing um but they're also you know those kind of covert um characterizations like are they the kind of person that like everyone at the office goes to or are they the kind of person who you know thinks that they're really good at their job but they're actually terrible at their job um so i'm i'm just i'm interested in general um in the sort of character doors that work can open and it's I usually know what a character does for a living before I start writing them so I, I wouldn't necessarily say that's you know stories begin in very different ways for me but um I think to begin a story I, I usually need to know what the point of view character um or the narrator does for a living and also where the story is set um place is um, you know, is, is a very um, important part of my work. And even if I intentionally sort of make the setting ambiguous, this is actually a story is set um, in my hometown in Central Florida. And I chose not to name the place partly to sort of nudge, begin kind of nudging the story's um, sense of reality toward kind of the surreal leap that it ultimately takes. But um, but I know where it is and, and I can see, I can see the, the streets um, and I can see the trees and all of that. So I think that that, yeah, that both of those kinds of groundings for me are very important at the start of a story. I'm really interested in what you said, Laura, about um, you knew exactly where the story was set, but you chose uh, not to use the real name of the town. Is that, um, is that part of a way of trying to um, separate yourself from the, um, um, from I guess I would call it the more personal uh, milieu of the story. Um, mm. you say um, in this particular story, you're, you're preparing the way for that uh, surreal leap that it takes. And then so I, I start to think about how sometimes maybe we, we get too close to uh, um, uh, where we are in the story. And so I'm wondering if that's a way that um, you uh, try to distance yourself just, uh, just a tad from uh, the, the setting as you imagine it in your mind. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's, it's e even when I'm writing places that I know it really intimately, like, I do think you kind of have to create that sort of, it's, it's a kind of a gap um, between the place that you know and the place that you're writing. So it can have that um, sort of fictive life force. Um, I also, so there are two reasons to not um, name the place uh, 
One is that um, I wanted a little bit fle of flexibility in order to move things around. So like my sister has um, a residential motel that descriptively matches Slumberland at the end of her street. The actual Slumberland is like on the side of a highway. Um, so I've sort of, you know, you there's a little, I, I feel a little freer with some of the geography when a place isn't, um, when a place isn't named. But I think also, you know, I did a really interesting exercise um, in a with um my students once when we were we were talking about place and we read two stories and um they're both wonderful stories um one is um pleasure boating in latuya bay by jim shepherd and the other is old mrs j um by yoko gawa and um and we and both of them both of those stories a place is very central the physical landscape is very central um but we talked about how in old mrs j there's, um, we're not situated in a specific name, town, or even region. And we know that there's ocean and we know that there are mountains, um, but we don't, you know, we're, we're, that's all the sort of situating we get. And we talked about how that is, does kind of, before um, surreal things begin to happen in that story, that a little bit of fuzzing is already occurring, I think, in the choice to not name the place. Whereas, um, you know, Shepard, more situated in the space of, um, you know, psychological realism, like he doesn't need that kind of fuzzing. The story that he's writing doesn't require it. And in fact, it benefits from the opposite, which is like hyper specificity. Um, so I, I think that that, I think that when we make those decisions, um, sometimes they're practical decisions or personal decisions, but they're also decisions uh, that impact the feel of the story's reality. And because this is a story where like a, a surreal or haunted thing does happen, but it happens quite late in the story, I was thinking about how can I how can I create some of those, um, say, like micro distortions or a little bit of that fuzzing or a little bit of that instability um, in a way that can sort of create a bridge to that larger dislocation that comes um, in, in the story's final pages. And so I think for me to, um, to be specific uh, with my descriptive language, but not necessarily specific with the geography was a way to begin to introduce that instability. Oh, I'm, I'm really fascinated by that answer, uh, Laura, and, and just thinking about uh, the way setting operates um, to help create the sort of world you want in the story. Uh, as you say, the world that sort of blurs the edges a little bit. Um, uh, thanks for that answer. We have our, uh, we have our first question from the audience, and uh, I'm going to continue to encourage folks to uh, type your questions into the Q&A um, box. Uh, this question comes from Shannon. Um, uh, she says, do you have any advice for fiction writers moving from short form stories into long form projects? What is different about your process or approach for novel writing? Yeah, thank you for that question. I have so, <laughs> how much time do you have? I have many, many, yes, I have many thoughts on this. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to my, maybe just sort of describe my experiences a little bit, and then I can offer a couple of things that have worked for me. I think, um, you know, when I'm working on a story, I can hold the whole thing in my head. And so with um, Slumberland, the story that I read this afternoon, I had a sense of where I wanted to start and I had a sense of where I wanted to land. I didn't necessarily know how I was going to get there or what would happen in the middle. And there were certainly some surprises that came up in the writing process, but there was a kind of loose shape that I could hold in my imagination. Um, so when I'm working on a story, my work habits are more erratic. You know, I write when I feel like writing, sometimes I can write a draft in one city, sitting, Sometimes it's sort of scattershot and maybe I write a draft incrementally over the course of several weeks. Um, I, don't, um, I don't necessarily feel compelled to introduce a lot of structure into my process. With long form projects, I've found the opposite to be true. Um, I've been working on a novel this year and I'm, I'm a much more sort of structured um, writer when I'm working on a long form project. I usually have either a word count that I'm aiming to make most days um, 
or um, an, you know, a certain amount of pages that I'm trying to write by the end of the month to create some like basically a concrete kind of containers. And there are a couple of reasons why for me, this has been important. I think with any sort of long-term anything, right? Like, you know, it's just imagine going on like a few dates with this person and then they're like the most wonderful person you could possibly meet. And you're like, this is amazing. And we're going to move in together and it's going to be awesome. And then you move in together and they're like, okay, there's still, there are a lot of good qualities, but also you know, there are these downsides that I'm starting to see now that I've spent enough time with this individual and, and you know, the relationship becomes more complicated. Um, this is the same thing with a novel, right? Like you can still have this amazing, wonderful, brilliant idea, but you start introducing more plot threads. You, you know, spend more time with this project. You start to see some of the challenges that are going to emerge down the road. And all of a sudden, you know, you can have those days where you wake up and you're like, do I really want to be spending this much time with you? Like, I'm not quite sure. And I think that, um, you know, there are moments where, you know, we doubt ourselves, where we doubt, or I should say, I hope you shouldn't, but I do. Um, I doubt myself. I doubt my capacity to do the work. I doubt my ability to write the book that will live up to my the sort of idealized version of it um, that lives in my imagination. And I get scared um, for, you know, just to be very um, kind of candid. And so I think having a really structured daily practice where no matter if I'm feeling like jazzed as hell to sit down and work on this book or bored or scared or uncertain, it is a part of my life to sit down and write a thousand words a day or 500 uh, words a day or whatever. Um, I would also add that that really works for me. And for me, the consistency of practice, it's, it's like a rope in a sea, you know what I mean? And it's just this thing that can kind of pull you through um, until you reach the shore of that first full draft. Um, for some writers that kind of very structured incremental process really doesn't work. Uh, and, it, and it ultimately is sort of more frustrating than generative. So when I say practice, it does not have to look like my practice or like the practices of your professors. All that matters is that it works for you. Maybe you don't write all week, but you write like a lot on Saturday and Sunday. Um, maybe you write by hand, maybe, you know, you structure your practice in a different way entirely. But I think if you're if you're looking to make that transition between the short and the long form, I would think about what kind of practice do I need to cultivate for myself to make this project sustainable? And what kind of guardrails can I build into that practice so that when I get bored, when I get scared, when I get uncertain, I will have some sort of structure to kind of hold me in place, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so that's, yeah, I think that, that that's what I would say. And also like read the books that you feel are in conversation with the book that you want to be writing. Like, of course, they'll be different because you're you and only you can write your book. But I think, um, you know, sometimes we can get skittish about influence, but like, you know, I, I mean... I was talking to an undergrad and I had recommended um, Bolaño's uh, 2666 to them because they were working on a very long project with parts that were quite different from one another. And they're like, yeah, but Bolaño has such a strong voice and I'm just worried that I'm going to absorb it and then start writing like he did in 2666. And I was like, if that happens, that's the least of your problems. Um, you know, I think we, we have to trust that... Um, that our own vision will shine through. And then also it's actually like, I mean, I would be thrilled if I woke up tomorrow and started writing like Bolaño, that would be a dream. Um, but, but that our old vision will, will shine through and it's actually harder to write like other writers than it might appear to be. Um, so, so I think to treat like inspiration as kind of a generative thing versus something that is you know harmfully contagious um, and to read books that maybe share you know, structural similarities with your project or other kind of similarities and see how writers, you know, if you're writing, say, a multiple POV novel, read a lot of multiple POV novels, see, see how other writers kind of solve certainly questions or challenges or fail to solve those questions or, or challenges. I think that can be useful as well.
That is some excellent advice, Laura. I can tell that our students are going to be in great hands with you in workshop tomorrow. Um, I love the thoughts you have about finding what works for you. Um, and I also think that uh, you're really right about um, you know, the novel um, taking um, a certain degree of commitment that gets challenged all the time by um, our own doubts and our, our fears and our insecurities. Um, here's a question from Saheli. Um, she says, do you have any tips about how to maintain a surrealist sheen over the course mm. of a longer novel? It feels like in longer books, we end up doing more world building than a short story requires. And with that often comes more of an expected adherence to logic to fill in the gaps. Are there specific ways that you're able to maintain internal logic in a longer work that the reader isn't tempted to sort of poke holes in? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question, um, and I think you, I think I know, I think I, I think I know what you mean. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of like repeat back how I understand the question, and then please feel free to chime in in the chat if I if I'm totally bungled it. But like, there's some there's some books where there's a sort of I love the word sheen, so we'll go with that a kind of surrealist sheen, but it doesn't necessarily of evolve into a plot point or um or it doesn't necessarily like amplify like the over the course of the book in way a kind of a haunted house novel it might start surreal and then amplify into horror um it's just this sort of like steady thrum of kind of strangeness and how do you create that kind of world without a, without inviting readers to um want more or less of the surreal machine is that is that a, a fair interpretation? This is where Zoom. <laughs> this is where where Zoom is, is weird. Well, I'll just I'll keep talking and until and you can say let me know if that was not a fair interpretation. But, um, you know, I think that uh, th this has a lot to do that idea of building um, internal logic. I, I I do think that it it has to do with um, sensibility uh tone and um and also character psychology to a certain degree i think of so i think of tone like just to tone is an elusive thing to describe which is why i'm already struggling a little bit to describe what i think tone is i understand tone to be the point of view of the world and there are some writers who write um books tonally that are just in a slightly off kilter or surreal vein. I mean, I think of, you know, um, Grace Kurlanovich's novel, The Orange Eats Creeps, which is a super weird book that I really love. Um, the French writer, Marie Denis um, Ladivine and Rosie Carp is actually like amazing at this kind of writing. Like she like would be one of the best people for you to read. Um, Again, the titles of her books that I would recommend are, are Ladivine and Rosie Carp. And, um, and I think also like Helen Oyemi is working a little bit more in the, um, the, the fairy tale retelling vein. But I think she, she creates a sort of tonal landscape where certain things are possible, um, even when she's not really departing from realism as in the laws of physics are being violated. Um, and I think Marie... Um, Bertino is another is another writer that does the, does that kind of work really beautifully. So I think that um, part of it is is just sort of tone is like frequency. It's like a radio frequency, you know. And when you find that right frequency, you can feel a fictional world sort of gel. And then of course, the, you know, the the next logical question would be like, that's sounds great, how do I find that frequency? And for me, it just takes a tremendous amount of trial and error. Um, and it does feel like, I know we all have our phones, you know, we're not listening maybe to the radio anymore, but I still sometimes listen to the radio in the car and will and like to surf. And it is that feeling of like, I'm looking for a certain tempo, I'm looking for a certain beat and I'm kind of turning the dial and turning the dial. And then when I hit it, I know it. 
Um, I think the other way, so that's one way to think of it, sort of the point of view, not so much of the characters, but what is the point of view of the world? What is the sensibility of the world? And what's kind of possible in this space? Um, I think the other way to come at it is through sort of character psychology and the internal um, the internal logic of a character. So like a novel um, called The Naked Eye by Yoko Tabata um, is a book that was super formative for me. And it's a very short novel um, translated from German by Susan Bernowski about a young woman pre uh, fall of the Berlin Wall who goes to um, travels from Vietnam to Germany to give a talk at a youth conference and is abducted by a German man and held captive for some time. This happens in like the first two pages. Um, the book really charts what happens after she escapes. And the book takes a lot of surreal turns. Um, and the most being um, is that this character becomes obsessed with French cinema and she becomes obsessed with Catherine Deneuve films. And at as the in the last sort of quarter of the book, the cinematic world and the experiential world really begin to merge into one another and to the point where it's sometimes hard to tell like is this happening in a movie or is this happening in real life and um that those sort of surreal movements are guided completely by character psychology and i think that's what makes it so it doesn't feel aim to me it does not feel aimless or disjointed or wandering it feels like richly compelling and that we're being pulled into something sort of uh, scary and powerful and traumatic and liberating. Um, because if you think about the perspective of this character is like, I'm trying to figure out how to survive um, this horrible trauma. And the, the, the secret that I found is to like create this imaginary you know, world that I get to live in with Catherine Deneuve. Um, and, and it's a really, I mean, I think kind of a really beautiful book um, and also like a, like a powerfully sad book at the same time. And I think, so that's, that's another, you know, and certainly the character psychology like need not be rooted in trauma or suffering. That's just the example that happened to come to mind. But I think the other way to think about it is what is, what is it, what is coming through the character that might make the surreal sheen have that sort of integrity and have those kind of deeper tendrils. Um, and, and also sometimes it's place. Sometimes it could come through place. There are certain places like Florida, um, for example, uh, where I'm from, that just sort of le lends, lends itself to that sort of sheen. Um, so there are all kinds of different like conduits. But I think the, I think the, 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 that question, the sort of second part of that question about not inviting readers to not um, poke holes and stuff like I think there, there are a couple of different ways to think about that first some people will and they're just not your readers and that's okay like you know nothing is for everybody um, but for for your kind of like ideal ideal reader ideal audience or, or those people that you know you really want to be kind of writing towards um, and imagining towards I, I think I think that the surreal is the most kind of convincing and compelling when there is some sort of deeper pull, um, when it doesn't feel decorative, when it doesn't just feel like a stylistic flourish, when there is something, you know, there's something underneath it. Um, and again, that can come from the consciousness of a character, it can come from place, it can come from the tonality of the world, um, or some combination thereof. But I do feel like that piece is important, that there's some sort of um, the surreal is, um, you know, it's another way of communicating with our readers, right? It's a different kind of language. So what are we using the language to say that we couldn't say in a more straightforward way? I think that's the question that a certain stage in the process, like I really press on with my own work. Laura, I can tell you that Saheli gave an emphatic yes to uh, your question about whether you had interpreted the question correctly. Um, so I think you you nailed it. Uh, awesome. Um, and your your thoughts about character psychology segues nicely into the next question. This one from Macy, who says, "Can you discuss building character a bit? Uh, the ones in this story and in the collection in general are so embodied and strange and interesting and believable." Yeah, thank you. Um, I think for me, you know, there, like I was saying, um, 
in response to one of Lee's questions earlier, there are some things that I need to know before I begin a story, but character is one of those things, like I might know a few, like where's this person living? What do they do for, for work? But um, character is, is often very mysterious to me when I began. So it, it's, it is, it's this process of like excavation um, and just sort of slowly kind of do like an archeological dig. I've never been on one myself, but from, from what I've seen in movies, um, this process of sort of slow digging and kind of like, you know, brushing off until some kind of shape emerges. That's my experience with writing character. Um, I do, and there's there's still a lot. I'm not, you know, there, there are absolutely some writers who even for a short story, they're like, I know everything there is to know about this person. Only 5% of what I know is in the story. And I don't work that way. Um, everything that I know about the characters in the story. And that means that there's a lot that I don't know. There's a lot that remains kind of cloaked in mystery um, you know, for, for myself. And so I think the shape that I'm looking for is not necessarily sort of every detail about this person's life, but these um, kind of formative qualities or formative turning points um, that I, I, I need the story to, to illuminate. Um, and I think, you know, I'm always looking for situations where I kind of, like I was saying with work, we're both like, um, covert and uh, and and overt character work can be done, um, and and so and I think that 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 really is about just putting the character in contact with the world. Um, you know, what does it say about this character that she only wants to be out taking photographs at night? Um, what does she say? What does it say about her that when she hears this wailing woman next to her, she doesn't think like my God, is this, do they need an ambulance? Like, should I knock on their door? Do they need a fruit basket? Like it's, you know, her, her response is not one of, you know, empathy or connection. It's one of, um, I know that kind of grief or what she assumes to be that kind of grief. And it scares me and I want to get away from it as quickly as possible. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, I think, I think my approach is very much about, putting the character in contact with the world and seeing how they respond to the contact and then kind of pondering, what does that tell me about who they are sort of at a surface level, but also kind of the deeper waters that might be churning um, within. Uh, Laura, that, that response you just gave <clears throat> makes me think that uh, you perhaps are um, always leaving yourself open to um, the characters um, as far as their ability to surprise you um, through the writing. Um, would you like to say anything about the, about the element of surprise for the writer? Oh yeah, I mean it's the best, right? It's what we it's what we it's what we do it for. I'm I'm um, the novel that I'm working on. It's in multiple parts, and there's. Um, there's one first person section and when I just finished a draft of that first person section and like it was there was so yeah so many moments where um, that character surprised me like or I like saw something sort of right before you know I realized it was what was going to happen and and I was deeply surprising and it was a really like fun experience and it's we I mean it's the strange thing about all this is is that we're like surprising our selves um but i think that you know the the there are different parts of the brain that work in different ways and there's like the part of the brain that i make a grocery list with and then i, I mean i'm i'm no neurologist but then there there's the other part of the brain i have no idea what it's called but it's like you know it's like where dreams come from um and premonition and uh deja vu um at all of those different sort of more elusive kinds of consciousness and i think when we surprise ourselves it means like we're working from that space i i think it's it's a hard state to like will um but i find the more I'm sort of the more committed I am to my to per, to my practice, the more um, accessible that more submerged part of the 
you know, consciousness becomes. Um, so I think that that, yeah, I mean, I think that that, that's sort of what it suggests to me that, um, that we are, yeah, we're in contact with those sort of like deeper waters within the self. And like, we don't know exactly what's down in there. Um, and, and, and that's what makes, yeah, those, those sort of surprises on the page so thrilling. Oh, thanks for that answer, uh, Laura. We are, uh, we are turning toward the top of the hour and I have uh, two more questions here in the Q&A. And so I'll invite you, if you have any other questions that you would like to ask Laura, to please go ahead and type those in. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reverse the order of these two questions, yeah. just because uh, um, a question from Mira seems to be um, in the flow of what we're talking about right now. And then we'll, we'll shift gears with uh, the second question. But Mira says, continuing in the elusive vein, can you please speak to the subject of voice? Oh, happily. Um, I, yeah, I mean, voice is also elusive to describe. I think, and I think sometimes too, we can, um, sometimes when we say voice, we mean the voice of a writer, like a writer with a really distinct, um, Joy Williams is someone, um, even though she writes very different uh worlds in her novels in her novels in particular I mean the world of like Harrow is very different her latest book um highly recommend is very different than the world of you know her earlier novel Breaking and Entering or The Quick and the Dead um my personal joy favorite uh but you know her sentences are so distinctive I mean I feel completely confident that if you gave me a list of like 50 sentences from books and you said find the one from a, like I could like pull, you know um, I think that like, I would bet money and I would bet money that not just me, like, I, I mean, I am like an Uber fan, but I mean, I think a lot of other people who have read a Joy Williams could also pick out that sentence because her voice is very, very distinct. Um, so sometimes we mean it that way, uh, that there's, there's a, there's a sensibility, a quality, um, a, a quality to the sentences, a, a sort of um, a rhythm, a sound, an atmosphere that the sentences generate uh, that carry over from book to book. But I, you know, I, I think, um, imagine if we're thinking about voice kind of in the context of a particular work, I, I think, of, I tend to think of voice in relation to character. Like I think of tone as the sensibility of the world. And I think of voice as sort of the sensibility of the individual character. Um, and sometimes those can be sort of beautifully like at odds uh, in a certain way. You know, I think Dennis Johnson was someone with, um, you know, Jesus's son, like fuck had had this, has this dreamy poetic, occasionally brutal, but kind of like floaty sort of voice and way of seeing um, that's often met tonally with a very like harsh and unforgiving world. Um, so it can be interesting to think how sometimes um, almost like an oppositional voice and tone can create an interesting sort of energy in a work of fiction. Um, I don't know, that's not really like an official craft definition, I don't think, but that's just sort of how I, I, I tend to sort of think about voice in the context of the character. You know, how do they, how do they move through the world? What kind of like, what's, the, what's their vibe? Um, how do they talk to other people? How do they talk to themselves? Um, those are all things that I think about when I'm thinking about voice. Uh, Laura, we're gonna shift gears to um, the publishing world. Uh, Sophia asks, what has your experience been with changing publishers? So I, I've only had one experience with changing publishers and I'm happy to um, speak to it. Uh, my first collection, was published by an indie press called Design Books. And then the um, subsequent books have been um, with uh, FSG. And I think, um, you know, it, in some ways, like I loved starting, I loved being with an indie house in a lot of ways. I think at the time, my first book came out in 2009 and there was such, and still is too, I, I don't mean to talk about it like in a, in a, you know, in the past tense, but um, I, I felt so fortunate to like join this really wonderful 
creative, um, interesting community of writers who were who had books on indie presses. Um, I, I was living in Baltimore at the time and I, like all, all the writers that I hung out with practically, like we were all on indie presses and it was just like the, uh, I don't know, like this like very, very creative, generative um, DIY spirit. Um, and I, and I really loved, you know, just in a small way, getting, getting to be part of that. And I, I think for a very long time, like indie presses have taken risks, do still take risks on books um, that other, you know, that bigger publishers just simply wouldn't. Um, one of my favorite indies right now, and I read like almost all their books is uh, $2 radio. Um, and I just love their commitment to publishing like what they love um, and 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 their their enthusiasm for their writers is, is really contagious. Um, but when I think going to a bigger house, I was a little bit scared that um, I would sort of feel like lost in this um, corporate like monolith. Uh, but that has not been my experience. I think because FSG is a is you know kind of a still like a relatively small house, of course, within a bigger um, within a bigger kind of corporate machine of, you know, Mac Macmillan corp or umbrella of, of Macmillan. Um, but I think like the, the, the best part of it for me is I've had the same editor for all of those books, which is very rare in this day and age, whether you're with, you know, a small house or a large house or, or a medium sized house. Um, but particularly at the bigger houses, that's a, actually a really nice thing about at the lot, a lot of, I think indie presses have fewer, um, a little less turnover editorially. There's a lot more at the bigger house. So I'm very, very lucky um, to have been able to publish uh, four books um, with my editor, Emily Bell. And we have like, have had a really very close um, creative partnership. And that's been one of the, the sort of great blessings of my life as a, as a writer. And it, it would not have happened if I had not moved houses. So I think that that, that I'm not sure if that gives like a practical answer to your question, because again, I've, I've only had this, I've only had this experience once. Um, so I only know what I know, but um, yeah, in my case, it was, it was definitely um, the best move for, for my, not only my work, but for my, um, I think the, yeah, the opportunity to have like a real sort of creative partnership with an editor. Laura, thank you so much for the uh, uh, plug for Two Dollar Radio, lo located right here in Columbus. Yeah, Ohio. yeah, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Uh, oh, they're um, yeah, they're amazing. Well, listen, I think we've come to the end of the uh, questions from the audience, and uh, I just want to thank everyone for coming uh, to this event, and a big thank you to Laura for being so generous with her time. Uh, thank you, Laura, for the wonderful reading. Thank you for the generosity of your responses to the questions. Uh, and uh, we're, we're very, very proud and happy to have you visiting Ohio State, even if it is virtually. And I hope your time uh, tomorrow in the workshop um, uh, goes well for you. Thanks so yeah. much, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.